Hi, my name is Wendy Johnson. I'm with the Indianapolis Public Library. I'm the Volunteer Engagement Specialist, and we're here today to talk about volunteer recruitment, retention, and a variety of other volunteer-related tasks and thoughts. For those of you who are just now starting a volunteer program or are ready to jumpstart a program that you may already have in place and just wanna take it to the next level. I'm happy that you guys are here and welcome. We'd also like to say thank you to our sponsors for today. Meridian Foundation and the Indianapolis Public Library Foundation are all great sponsors for the library and we appreciate their support of this nonprofit series. A couple housekeeping things that we need to think about. Um, first off, you will have access down the line for handouts and tools. Those will be made available to you as you register and access this video. There are also throughout the presentation a variety of little question mark bubbles. And those question mark bubbles are an opportunity for us to take a pause and think about the questions that are at hand. And also a place for me to say, what do you think about this? You'll also see little red flags throughout. Those flags are the most important part of this presentation. So if you're in a hurry, you could zoom on past to get to those red flags and go, oh, that's something important I need to remember. And we'll be seeing those as you come along and I will be pointing those out to you as well. So let's get started. What are the barriers that are preventing you from engaging volunteers within your organization? Here's our first chance to use one of those question mark bubbles. What do you think is causing you to have that, I don't know if I wanna put volunteers into my organization or we're having issues with our volunteers and I'm not quite sure how to resolve that concern. What are those barriers? What's stopping you? We're gonna address a lot of those things today, but let's figure out what's really holding us back. Some of those possible barriers that might've popped into your head are, oh my gosh, I have no clue. Where do I start? What makes sense for me to put a volunteer engagement activity plan together. Or you might be saying, I already have way too much stuff on my plate and I just don't want to do anything else. Volunteers are just gonna stretch me way too far. No capacity for this. You may also find that you say, you know what, volunteers are great and awesome and wonderful for other people, but I can just do it faster by myself. We also have this concern from our staff that might say, they'll do it all wrong. Well, you know what? We train our staff and our staff don't do it wrong. So we need to talk about training for our volunteers too. We also see concern sometimes that barrier of dependability. They won't show up when we ask them to. They'll be late, they'll cancel. Talk some about that. We always worry about our data and access to our personal and private records, especially if you're living in a healthcare or a high risk population environment, where we wanna make sure that access to that information is really secure. And how do we prevent that being a concern for our volunteers to be able to access it? And then the final thing that usually pops up around now is what if I'm a union shop or a non-union shop? In a, non, in a union shop, there are always concerns about how a volunteer can be integrated into your environment without it affecting the staff and how the staff feel about those activities that they're performing. So we'll talk about that too. We're gonna sweep all of those barriers away. Volunteers are super important to an organization, especially in our nonprofit environments. They allow us to have the next level of engagement with our community. They are advocates for your organization. They will talk about the activities that you provide for them, that all the services that you offer, they will talk about those with their friends and family. So they're increasing our circle of friends and our circle of influence. They support our staff and our patron activities. They are a voice for us and a fresh set of eyes. It's always nice to have another set of opinions. We like to be able to say, we've always done it this way. 
but you bring a volunteer into an environment and a volunteer might say, I know you've always done it that way, but have you considered? And that only makes us stronger, makes us a better organization. They might bring new resources and skills. You might find that you bring pro bono volunteers in to do projects that otherwise your budget wouldn't be able to allow. And most importantly, your volunteers allow your staff and your volunteers together to further the mission of your environment. They provide that support. It's also kind of nice to be able to say that volunteers also help us with fundraising. Did you happen to know that volunteers who are in your organization are 87% greater opportunity for them to also be donors? And their donations tend to be 10 times greater than those individuals who are not volunteers. It makes a difference when a person is directly connected to your organization on what their funding is to your organization. We also see that our corporate volunteers have the opportunity to also increase your donations. And we know that there are programs like Dollars for Doers where a volunteer might volunteer um, 10, 15 hours and their organization matches those hours with dollars to your organization or to an organization that the volunteer specifies. And we wanna make sure that we have access to those kinds of resources because not only are they increasing our circle of influence, but they might also be helping with our bottom line. So in today's discussion, we're gonna talk about how to create those meaningful opportunities, how to recruit the right volunteer for your organization and how to retain your volunteers through appropriate and effective retention or recognition. It is really big topics, big, big topics. So we have some fine print. Any one of these concepts could be a full day or two days long in conversation. We are constantly learning about how to improve these processes within the profession. And secondly, my other fine print item is our focus is on ongoing volunteers, those who come back week after week, month after month. Although many of these concepts are also appropriate for group volunteer activities and engaging uh, one-time project volunteers. So if you've got those kinds of folks, these rules and concepts will also apply. So let's get started. Creating meaningful opportunities. If you had, and this is the million dollar question, all the time and money in the world to support your organization, what is it that you would like to do? For me, I always look at what's on the back burner. What are, are the projects that I really want to accomplish that I know will really elevate my organization, that will push our mission further, What's on the back burner that I just can't get to because of all the day-to-day -day minutia that I have to work with? I want to make sure that I can get to that back burner, but how do I get there? I need help, right? And that's where a volunteer and a volunteer engagement can happen to help you get to those back burner projects to help you improve your mission. So here's those thought bubbles again. What is it that you wish that you could get done in your organization? and you just can't get to because you don't have the time or you don't have the resources. Some of the great meaningful opportunities are ways for us to engage volunteers. The, this list is super short. There are thousands of ways that you can engage volunteers, but these are the ones that seem to be popping up a lot right now. A social media ambassador, where a volunteer may never actually step foot in your organization, but they are responsible for spreading the word about your organization through social media. Whether you're asking that individual to actually create the content and put the media out there, or if you're just asking them to continue to push those messages that your communications department already does. You may ask for administrative support. 
administrative support. Let's talk about minutia. I've got all this stuff floating around in my office and I just can't get to the things that are important because I have all this filing I have to do or all these mailings I have to get out. Bring a volunteer in and help them become part of your organization through administrative support. You may also look for skills-based or pro bono. I have a friend of mine in the volunteer arena who has asked a group of lawyers to come into her organization and they did a complete risk management plan, took them a few months to work on and they reported back all the things that her organization needed to do from a risk management standpoint, including her volunteer program. And they did that all for free. You might have volunteers that are trainers or mentors or literacy trainers. You might have all kinds of volunteers that are helping to train your clientele. There's a lot of expertise out there right now and you could tap into that. In organizations that have spaces to share, you might find docents or tour guides or a greeter. In fundraising, this is actually the biggest place where volunteers are utilized in our statistics across the country. And that's about those galas and those parties and those silent auctions. Volunteers are excellent word of mouth, bring their friends, talk it up, provide resources for those auction items, for the gala, for finding a location, for being the committee to plan those activities where they do the, the grunt work, I'm sorry to use that word, but they use, they do the work where you are helping guide that activity and that work. And then finally, don't forget that your board members are also volunteers. It's such a meaningful opportunity to be helping to guide an organization. And ultimately, what do you need your volunteers to do to help you further your mission? When you're creating a meaningful opportunity, don't be afraid to step outside the box. Be innovative, be creative, involve family opportunities. Look at your community partners, your corporations, and your civic groups. Look for offsite projects where in this environment, they might be doing virtual tasks for you, like that ambassador we talked about. For the library, we have virtual opportunities at times that are digital transcription where we have a collection of items that are historical documents that have all been scanned. And they're in what I refer to as grandma cursive. And they need to be converted into text so that they are a historic record of our community. Those are great virtual opportunities. We also look for offsite projects that are in the community. Maybe this is where you say, we need a group of people to come through and remove all the invasive species on our property or in the creek across the street. And we always wanna look for opportunities that allow our volunteers to work from home. There's an organization here in Indianapolis that asks volunteers to take home materials, pick them up. It's like a drive-by, pick up materials. And those volunteers are sitting at home building no-sew blankets for cancer patients. Comes home, goes right back to that cancer patient. That volunteer knows that what they're doing has meaning and impact and is improving the life of a person, another fellow human. It's so awesome. When I build volunteer opportunities, I am always looking for the win, win, win. We've all heard about the win, win, but a three-way win? A three-way win in a volunteer environment is a win for the organization. The organization gets to move forward, gets taken care of those smaller items, those issues that are of concern. And then the second win is for your client or your customer. They benefit because those volunteers have helped the staff and the organization. So the client benefits because our staff has the ability to do those back burner items. And then of course the volunteer wins. Do you know that when you volunteer endorphins release in your body and it makes you happier and healthier. There's all kinds of studies about it. It's true. Volunteering is good for us. 
and we should all do it. And we should be able to create meaningful opportunities that allow volunteers to have that runner's high so that they can volunteer and serve your organization well. So here's our first red flag. That's about volunteer position descriptions. They are so important in building a program. They give you boundaries and they give your volunteer a clear expectation of what they need to be doing to help you. In a position description, you're going to identify the things that mean what is a volunteer going to do? What's the impact that this position or role has for your organization? And even down to the small things about what to wear and where to park and who's my supervisor if I have a question. A volunteer position description also gives you the opportunity to make corrective action. So what happens if a volunteer sort of decides that they know better and they start doing things that you didn't ask them to do and are maybe detrimental to your organization? Other than having that initial conversation to say, hey, maybe that's a good idea, you might also want to look at that volunteer and say, you know, the position description that we brought you in to work on is not what you're doing. Can you tell me what's going on? And if that doesn't work, maybe a second go around with that conversation. If it's radically incorrect activity, that position description gives you some space to say to that volunteer, this is what we brought you in for, this is what you're doing, and those two things don't match. And maybe it's time that we find a different opportunity for you. Whether that opportunity is inside your organization or if that opportunity is connecting that volunteer to a different organization where their skills might be better fit. So we have some examples and this is part of those tools that you'll be receiving and have access to. But I wanted to give you a quick view of what one of these position descriptions might look like. So here, this is a template that you'll have access to. And in this template, we have the core basic information. What is the purpose? What is the volunteer role and responsibility? Qualifications and skills that are required for this particular activity that you're looking for. Also time commitment, volunteer screening process so that they know that if your organization is going to do a background check or if you need a health screening. We're also going to talk about how is supervision and training taken care of, along with what's required as far as personal appearance and dress. And then of course, we always wanna tell them about your mission and your vision, and then how to reach you if this is something that they really wanna do. This template, this is filled with questions about, tell me what the big picture is to help fill in the blanks as you build a volunteer position description for your organization. So now we're looking to look at how to recruit the right volunteer. It's important, like many of the things we're gonna talk about today, to make sure that this is a good fit, just like the Cinderella story. We wanna make sure we have the right shoe on the right person. And that also has to do with the types of volunteer opportunities that you've created and the kinds of roles and responsibilities of volunteers that are out there. What do they want to do? So we have kind of a fun little story a video to take a look at. The most important thing here at Keep Indianapolis Beautiful is our volunteers. And to prove it, we decided to go a day without them and replace them with mannequins. It quickly became clear to me that we were going to have a few issues. Hey guys, you can start any time. So, uh, do you guys know how trees access the internet? They log on. They log on. Everybody grab your shovels. Here you go. Volunteers are really important, our human volunteers. Can we uh, never do this again, please? So have you seen from the video, volunteering and the way we recruit for volunteers can be fun. 
And that helps our volunteers to see that there is a way for them to get connected and have a good time and meet other people, even if they might be mannequins. So where do I find all these people? When I want to find a volunteer for a particular activity, I need to think about what kind of activity it is that I am looking for. For example, if I'm looking for a group of individuals to help with a fun run, and I needed water distribution and t-shirts, a handout, and I need somebody to do timing, and I need a cheer squad, I'm looking for a lot of people. This skill set that's needed for a fun run isn't all that great. I just need lots of people, pretty low skill, lots of enthusiasm. So for that kind of opportunity, I can look at the general population. I can put an ad in the paper. I can do a blast on my social media and ask all my volunteers to help blast that out. I can go to scouting troops. I can go to civic organizations. Anyone in the general population can help with a fun run. But let's take a look at the next option here. And that's like a music Monday. We play music in our lobby, or we have a training program where we teach kids about a particular instrument once a month. That requires a very specific skill set. So I'm looking for targeted recruitment. And those individuals might come from someplace like the Musicians Union, or I might go to a local school or college in their uh, music program. We might look at community partners as well for connected recruitment. In connected recruitment, those community partners can help us because they're already part of our family of support. Here's an example. One of our library branches sits between um, a library and library property and a railroad track. And in between is this ditch, which is commonly referred to as a creek. At the time I saw this space, it was totally a ditch. The ditch caused a lot of problems because the kids couldn't see the trains go by from the windows of the library and they really enjoyed that. Plus the bigger problem, anytime we had a lot of rain, the rain from the ditch and the water would flow over on the parking lot and it was soaking wet for our patrons to get to the door. And in the winter time, it was even worse because that water would freeze and then our parking lot became really dangerous reliability concern all around. So we found community partners to help us with this. We have a longstanding relationship with an organization in town and we reached out to them and said, hey, here's the problem. Super impactful if they come and help us out. And we also have a terrific landscaping company that works for all of our branches. Those individuals from our corporate partner and from our service provider, our vendor, came together to make a solution. Our vendor came through the day before the project and chopped down all the bad trees that were in the way and all the underbrush. And then the next day they came back with big trucks, lots of tools to meet with our civic organization. And that organization worked from one end to the other, pulling out all the chopped leaves, the debris, the tires, the trash, they were able to muck out that creek area so that the water could effectively flow down the path and avoid our parking lot. So there's an example of where we use community partners to come together to make a resource and a project happen for us. And both of those organizations donated their time, their tools, and also all of their skill set on how to chop down trees properly. That same group of people had such a great time that they said they wanted to come back the next year and begin to plant some really healthy and important trees to that area. So the kids not only could see the trains, but they also had a place to picnic under the shade. Another possibility is for us to look at a closed system. In a closed system, we're looking for volunteer activities from volunteers that are already part of our volunteer roster. We have a set of active volunteers we have a high profile opportunity for them, like an author fair or an author's talk or a particular gala or event. And those volunteers have worked their way into our program and we trust them to do something very important for our program. 
So we say to our internal volunteers, here's something very special that only you are being asked to help with. It helps to elevate the volunteer, puts them a little higher than the general population, and it helps to make them feel good about how we trust them with a particular task or activity. And there's always the opportunity for you to put your opportunities, your volunteer tasks out into a brokerage, a brokerage like volunteermatch.com, which is a free service where you can list all of your volunteer opportunities along with your organization's profile with your vision, your mission, and any details about your organization that you wanna share with the community. Volunteer Match is web-based and it's available to anyone in the world to look at and search. There are also other programs similar to Volunteer Match. In Indianapolis, the United Way offers a really excellent volunteer search tool. And you might also consider looking at our um, AARP because they also have a search engine tool where you can post your opportunities and that just let those search engines do their thing to help you find volunteers. I have another tool for you to take a look at that will also be made available to you. And that is a volunteer, where do I find them, grid. This is courtesy of the United Way. Through this grid, you'll see that we have created a type of volunteer. What am I looking for? The types of traits that are associated where do I find them? And some of the challenges that you might face as you begin to look for that particular type of volunteer. This list is about four or five pages long. So I hope that you have an opportunity to take a look at it. It's also a really good place to start when you're brainstorming about how do I find volunteers for a particular task or activity within your organization. So when you're recruiting for the right volunteer, here's another red flag. Make sure you have a clear plan on how you're going to do your screening. Screening a volunteer that is a fun run is not as big a deal as screening a volunteer who might sit beside a patient in a hospice situation and be their companion and read to them. We have risk levels that we need to be considering any time we put a volunteer or staff member, for that matter, in touch with our clientele or with the public. So know what your roles are and know what risks are, are possible within that role. You also will need to know how many volunteers you need at that point in time and making sure that you have a clearly defined position description, that other red flag. Make sure you have a supervision plan as well. How are they going to be oriented, trained, and then supported for the ongoing process? There's nothing worse than a volunteer coming to the door all ready to go and then not have anyone there to support them. They will walk in a heartbeat or they'll never come back a volunteer. We also look at a standardized way of interviewing volunteers. Remember that fine point early on, we're talking about ongoing volunteers this time. An ongoing volunteer, we wanna have a standard set of questions that we follow. We document the interview process and we wanna make sure that at any point in time, it's okay for us to stop the interview. For example, if I have a volunteer who comes in and they say to me, I can't wait to volunteer for you. And we sit down and we do an interview and I'm working through my list of interview questions. And one of my questions is, why do you wanna volunteer now? What brought you to us at this point in time? And they say, well, you know, I've had a few DUIs and I need about 500 hours and volunteer community service. My organization or your organization might not accept court ordered community service volunteers. You can stop the interview at that point in time and say, hey, you know what? That's great. I'm glad you came to us but we don't do court ordered volunteers. We do offer you a list of opportunities of other organizations in the community that does. So it is okay to stop an interview if either one of you feel like, you know what, this is probably not a good fit. 
You might also run into that issue when you start talking to the volunteer and you're all gung ho and you both think it's a great fit and boy, this guy's got the skills. And then you find out that they're only available on Thursday night and you don't have any opportunities on Thursday night, at least not right now. So you can say to them, hey, this was a great interview. I'm really excited about how you wanna to connect to the organization, but we don't have anything for Thursday nights. Can I put you on a list and contact you at a point in time when we do have Thursday? And would you please let me know if your schedule changes because I wanna continue this conversation with you. So make sure you have interview process standardized so that there's no opportunity for discrimination in your volunteer selection and make sure you know what you're looking for before you start that interview process. We've already kind of touched around the edges about risk management. Risk management is important, not only for our staff, but also for our volunteers. We want to make sure that we've done everything we possibly can so that our organization doesn't show up on the front page of the newspaper in a negative way. So when we bring volunteers in, it's important to recognize whether or not we need to do background checks, whether we need to do a health screening for them like a TB test or they need a vaccination. For example, doctors across borders, when they go to different countries, they need vaccinations. When you're looking at their documentation and their record management, how are you tracking that? How are you keeping that? How are you keeping their information secure and in an easy to find manner? Also, remember risk management is much higher when you're working and interacting with clients and the public. So you wanna make sure that you've got those pieces taken care of as well. So there might be additional training that's required for your volunteer. And then in the realm of the volunteer is not a good fit, they're not working out, you need to have a plan before you start of what you are going to do if you need to terminate a volunteer. It's okay to let a volunteer go. It's hard, but it's okay if it's not a good fit. I like to use a washout process when I bring volunteers online. And this washout process allows a volunteer to self-select. When we start out with a volunteer may call you or they stop by and they say, hey, I really wanna volunteer and you're excited because you need those extra hands to help your organization. You provide them with information and man, here's the position description. This is what we're looking for. Does that sound like a great idea? And they say, yes, I can't wait. So they call you back and they schedule an interview. All right, so somewhere in between there, maybe they've said, no, this isn't great. And they don't call, that's okay. That's their first opportunity to self-select out. When they schedule an interview, that's great. If you put that interview together, they may say, oh, I don't know, I don't really wanna do this. And they may miss the interview altogether. And that's okay too, because at this point, something might've happened in their family situation, or they may have decided Maybe this isn't a good fit for me right now. And then finally, they might wash out on their first day after orientation and training. They've gotten a taste of what this opportunity looks like and they think, oh my gosh, this is not what I expected it to be. I don't think this is a good fit for me. And that's okay too, because when we have volunteers who self-select out, they're helping us identify what is a good volunteer for our organization? What is a good fit? Volunteers who are not a good fit for your organization are why we had all those barriers in the beginning, why it became difficult to, for us to say, oh, I do wanna bring volunteers in. But volunteers who are a good fit, who want to be part of your organization, who have shown the commitment, look at all these times they had to commit. They stopped by, they scheduled an interview, they came for the interview, they went through training and orientation. They've had all these opportunities to say, yes, this is the coolest opportunity. I want to be part of this organization. And this is how I want to be part of that organization and do the things that help them move their mission forward. It's okay when they select out. The other message that's here is please don't chase volunteers. 
it's okay if a volunteer misses an interview I would expect you to contact them and say, hey, are you okay? We, I, did I get the date and time wrong? Make sure they're okay. We're making friends. Interview process, this whole onboarding process is about making new friends. We're making friends who can help us and who we can help by improving their quality of life as a volunteer. It's a win, 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 remember? So we wanna make sure we don't chase after a volunteer we let them wash out and know that it's okay to say no because not everyone is a good fit. And that's hard. It's hard to say no sometimes. Our third topic today is about recognition and retention. And it's all kind of tied up together. When you volunteer, what are your pet peeves about your volunteer environment? I know this is a funny place to start when we're talking about recognition and retention, but if I have a pet peeve about the organization that I'm working for and it continues and it continues and it continues, I'm a volunteer. I'm likely to just walk away. So I really want you to think, what are your pet peeves? Another question bubble for you. What makes you go, ah, oh, like our friend Charlie Brown? Here are some of the top pet peeves in our Pivorama. They didn't need me today. There's nothing worse than having a volunteer plan their day out, put it on their calendar, get up, get dressed, arrange their kids in a different location, make sure that they can make it to you on time and they get there and they're ready to go. And you say to them, oh, I'm sorry. We don't have anything for you today. How frustrating is that? It's insanely frustrating. Even equally as bad is, oh, you're here today? Oh my gosh. And then they watch you run around the building, collecting supplies, talking to people to say, have you got anything? I don't have a project for them. What message are we sending? We're sending the message that says, oh, we really don't need you, but boy, it's really great to have you around. Bad idea. It's also incredibly peevish when we don't say hi, we don't say bye. Nobody said thank you to me. They don't even know my name. Can you imagine what it would be like if every staff member in your organization knew every volunteer's name and when they wa volunteer walks in the door, everyone said, hey, it's great to see you. I'm so glad you're here, Jim. We can't say thank you enough for the time that you spend with us as a volunteer before they even get started to work. That would be like crazy, right? How would you feel if someone said thank you to you every time you met them and they ran into you and they knew your name? Make you feel pretty good. Maybe feel a little creepy sometimes, but it would make you feel good. Tasks that are meaningless and busy work. There are some things about this that are important to know. Yes, it is okay to ask volunteers to stuff envelopes. Yes, that is on our plate, something that's very important and why is it important? If you tell your volunteers why those tasks are important, let's talk about stuffing envelopes, for example. Uh, every holiday, we do a donor request letter and that donor request letter is thousands of letters that are stuffed in an envelope and folded and labeled. And it is a time consuming process. If we have all of those volunteers sitting around a table and we're talking about this donor letter that we've done in the past, last year, the year before, the year before has generated X number of dollars for our organization, that adds meaning to what we would look at as a busy work project, it's giving us this full picture of what that task is about. And it's also saving you a bunch of time so that we can get to some of those back burner ideas. Please don't ever ask a volunteer to stay longer than their shift unless you know that they're okay with it. 
If you discover that their activity that you've asked them to come do takes longer, then have a conversation about, hey, maybe we need to add another day to your activity, or maybe we need to just increase your shift time another hour, and would that work for them? Just don't expect them to just stay just because the job is not done. Another peeve is not having any training or leadership. We talked about that already, about not having the support, not having somebody to go to when I don't know what to do next. Another peeve is, hey, you're doing it all wrong. That goes back to that training. If I haven't been properly trained, I don't think an organization has the ability or the right to say, you're doing it wrong. Teach me. I can handle it. I can do it right if you show me how. Another thing that happens is when an organization is stretched and you've got people going every one direction and a volunteer comes in to do a project and their supervisor, the person who's been identified as their go-to says, oh my gosh, I got to go. I got to do this other thing. And they wave by and say, hope you have a good evening. Leaving a volunteer stranded. Also not a good idea. We've already talked a lot about the why am I doing this part, making sure that volunteers understand the impact of the work that they're doing will solve a lot of these problems. Yeah, it may look like busy work and maybe it feels like busy work, but I know in the end, I'm helping my organization and I know why I'm helping my organization. So there are some rules about retention and recognition. Recognition is important. It can be done formally or informally. Basic guidelines to help put some framework around it. Give your recognition frequently using a variety of methods, whether that's a handwritten note or a piece of chocolate snuck into their sign-in book. Um, it could be um, a wide variety of things. There's all kinds of creative things and we're gonna talk about those. Make sure you give your recognition honestly. Don't just say thank you just because. Make sure it's honest and from your heart. Give it to the person and not to the work. If you say to a person, wow, those trees are beautiful. That's not really saying thank you to the person who spent their whole day digging holes and planting new trees. It's way more impactful to say to them, oh my gosh, you've worked so hard today. I can see that you know, you're know you grimy and grubby and I really appreciate the fact that you've dug 15 holes, you've planted gorgeous trees for us and you've made a more comfortable space for our clients. You've made a space that will last a long time and we appreciate all of the hard work you've done today. It's a whole lot, whole lot different of a message than saying, wow, those are great trees. Make the person the point of the things, not the work. Give it appropriately for your achievements. When you say to a person, oh my gosh, I wanna make you the volunteer of the year. And all they've done is, I don't know, stuff a few envelopes. It's really out of proportion. So make sure that you proportion the work and the achievement and the recognition all together. Give it consistently. Some day you give thanks, other days you don't. That's a mixed message. Did you know that recognition has an expiration date? It is true. Make sure when you are saying thank you that it's timely. I don't want to be recognized for something that I did six months ago. It's like a, an afterthought at that point. So make sure it's a timely thanks. Don't wait. Say thank you when it's due. Give it on an individualized basis as well. Some people don't want to be recognized out in public, in front of everyone. Others thrive on that. There are lots of different personality types. So make sure that you're paying attention to what your volunteer's personality is and what is most meaningful for them in the way of thanks. And finally, give it for what you want more of. 
if you want more time with these mailings, make sure you emphasize the importance of those mailings and the volunteers and how they're doing that work. So recognition is fun. It can be crazy fun. So I want you to consider what is the best recognition that you've ever received, whether it's at work or in a volunteer role. Think about it. What made you feel all warm and fuzzy? Here we have on the screen a variety of fun things, just objects. Imagine that I walked down the aisles of your favorite dollar store and I picked up a variety of just stuff that I thought, huh, I might be able to do something with these. As I look at these items, I was looking for things that I could say to my volunteers in a really fun, creative way, how much I appreciate them. It doesn't take a lot of money. And sometimes we don't have a budget for recognition but we can make it work. So here we see a packet of seeds, a little baby dinosaur, a little plastic kid's dinosaur, a box of mints, some lifesavers, and some party blowers. How would you use these in a way of fun recognition for your volunteer? I think the easiest one of all of these, of course, is the lifesaver. If we give a pack of lifesavers or even those little individual wrapped uh, mint lifesavers, I could say to my volunteers, hey, you were a lifesaver. You bailed us out of this drama, this, this crazy time, this whatever. You are a lifesaver to us. See, we can use puns. It's all okay. I might choose the dinosaur to say, wow, that was dinerific or that was dynamite tie a ribbon around its neck with a little tag that says, thank you. Even though it's a silly item and it's a moment, it is an opportunity for you to say thank you that I was thinking of you. The seeds are an easy one. Thank you for planting the seeds, new ideas. Uh, thank you for growing with us. Um, party blowers, always a way to celebrate. I'm gonna toot your horn. Um, because maybe you don't as a volunteer. We want to celebrate lots of ways. Um, with, the, uh, with the mint, you mean a mint to us. There are many, many, many ways to recognize our volunteers in a really fun way. Our recognition ideas can be both formal and informal. You might have a big party, a gala, a dinner or you might use some of the informal ideas that we've talked about today, whether they're fun or small or everyone saying hello and thank you. Those are pieces of recognition that your volunteers will really appreciate. In April, you'll find National Volunteer Week. It's a time that we all across the country say thank you to our volunteers, whether it's a small gift or a note or a card it is a time for us to celebrate their contributions to our organization. From recognition, it is important to involve all of your staff. They see the work that our volunteers are doing and it's important that they step up and say thank you. So maybe it's a video that you put together that includes all of your staff saying thank you, holding up signs. Maybe it's your staff standing at the front door when your volunteers come in and cheering them on. Involve your staff in recognition. It'll help to break down the barriers between your staff and your volunteers when they see the volunteers light up when they are told thank you by all of your staff. There are two tools that you'll receive. And the first of them is 101 ways to recognize volunteers from Volunteer Australia. It's a great list, lots of ideas and a good launching off point or other ideas that you might come up on your own that are appropriate for your organization. There's also a goofy list of ideas that continue on the theme of dinosaurs 
and breath mints and lifesavers. We've talked a lot today about many things. There's lots of information available. And so here are a few of the resources that are available to you. Volunteer Match, which we mentioned is a recruitment tool. It's available for free. They also have a large selection, a big library of volunteer management training. Short webinars, longer webinars that cover all of the topics we covered today, plus many, many more. And again, those are free. Points of Light, our national recognition, national volunteer organization, also includes a variety of tools, education, and conferences. Energize Inc., Volunteer Pro, are those organizations that were created originally by consultants that have opened their doors and provided free education and free webinars and free training to anyone who is interested in volunteer leadership. There are a variety of Facebook groups that are a great place to drop questions to say, I'm in this kind of an organization. Is anybody else in this organization? Have you run into this type of issue or concern? Those groups are really great about responding fairly quickly. In Indianapolis, the Central Indiana Association of Volunteer Administration is a peer group of volunteer leaders. We share a lot of ideas. We also bounce ideas off of each other. So in your community, look for your Association of Volunteer Administration. In Indianapolis, we meet once a month uh, online right now. Uh, we also have a coffee hour online, which is a great way just to get to know some of our people and get to know the kinds of resources that they work on. Minnesota Association for Volunteer Administration is Minnesota's state organization for volunteers. This is a great resource along with the Texas Volunteer Management Conference. Both of these organizations offer online training, resources, Again, those resources are free to anyone who wants to watch them. ALIVE is the Association for Leaders in Volunteer Engagement. If you're looking for a volunteer association, ALIVE has a complete list of those organizations and you can check state by state. Then of course, there are all kinds of books and speakers and individuals that have been in this industry for a very long time and have the resources and the knowledge and the history to help you along the way. We've talked about a lot of volunteer leadership role information today. We've talked how volunteers can help move your mission forward, how to be prepared for volunteer recruitment, making sure that you have clearly defined parameters through a volunteer position description, and how recruitment for the right volunteer leads us to screening processes and risk management tools. And then we had some fun looking at recognition and talking about informal and informal recognition processes. You'll have access to a variety of tools and resources that address each of these issues. I hope you've learned a few things today and I appreciate the time that you've spent with me. Again, if you have any questions about volunteer activities, please don't hesitate to reach out, drop me an email. I'll be happy to point you in the right direction. Volunteers are an important part of our nonprofit organizations and we need to be able to treat them well and know how to be prepared for them. Thank you for spending your time today. And thanks again to our sponsors, Meridian Foundation, and the Indianapolis Public Library Foundation for making this series possible.